Greetings, I'm Cyber Erectus. Here is my review of the Apple TV Plus Isaac Asimov's Foundation Season 1 Episode 8, titled The Missing Piece. First, I would like to give a standard spoiler alert disclaimer. If you haven't watched Episode 8 yet, please pause now and watch the show and come back to hear this review later. Thank you. Now, here is a recap of the episode. On board the Invictus, Salver Hardin and Louis Prien locked themselves inside the bridge trying to jack herself into the nav console in order to avert the ship's random jump sequence. Outside, Anacreans try to pry the door open. Floating slowly via spacewalk, Hugo arrives at an abandoned thespian mining asteroid and sends out a distress call to the Republic of Thespies. Anacreans get in the bridge and shot Lewis. Salver and Farah fight for control of the bridge. Meanwhile, the Thespians show up and fire at Invictus. Without a navigator at the helm, the ghost ship jumps away again. Back on the Raven, Hologram Hari Selden tells Gal Dornick about his intention to reach Helican and establish a secretive second foundation, poetically referred to as the Star's End namely due to its orbit around a black hole. Gaul increasingly becomes impatient and angry at Hari's refusal to tell her the true nature of the Second Foundation. It is purposely kept as a secret from his devoted Foundation and Cyclopedists on Terminus. Furiously, she destroys the Raven's heat exchange control and puts her own life in jeopardy. Hari reluctantly let Gaul leave the Raven in her escape pod. Once again in Stasis sleep, she sets course for Synax, this time for 138 years. On Maiden, the Holy Moon, Brother Day takes on the arduous spiral pilgrimage in the heat-soaked desert. He befriends an old pilgrim who encourages him to reach the sacred cave pool. However, the old man dies with exhaustion on their way there. Brother Day almost perishes, but he perseveres to the end. He bathes and drinks at the divine cave pool. Returning to the Luminous Conclave, Brother Day claims to have received the vision of a sacred, extinct three-petaled monocot flower. The Zephyrs interpret his vision as a holy sign from the Triple Goddess, three petals of the sacred birthroot flower, analogous to Luminism's three goddesses, were once one being. Brother Day's vision alludes to how he and his brothers Dusk and Dawn all stem from the same genetic source. Ergo, he must have a soul. Henceforth, any further criticism of the Cleon genetic dynasty, of clones without souls, will be deemed sacrilege in Luminism. The Zephyr's unanimous pronouncement in effect defeats Zephyr Halima and elevates Zephyr Gilat to be the next Proxima. Brother Day's victory is not enough. He orders Ido Demersel to assassinate Halima. As a religious luminist, Demersel is torn with the assignment because she admires Halima's devotion to luminism, but as a loyal robot, she is programmed to obey Cleon's commands. Halima knows her fate is sealed when Demersel divulges her spiral pilgrimage was made 11,000 years ago. Realizing she is about to die, Halima absolves Demersel and comforts her with the knowledge her sincere remorse demonstrates that she a robot, in fact, has a soul. On board the Imperial jump ship in orbit, Demersel questions if Brother Day made up his holy vision because he had seen the ancient sacred three-petaled birthroot flower pressed and framed on her vanity. Brother Day denies it. A tearful Demersel scolds him that, seeing nothing, she would not wish that emptiness on anyone. Just as he is in a stasis mesh ready for hyperspatial jump, Brother Day reminisces his observations in the cave on Maiden. In reality, he had no vision at all. That concludes the synopsis, and now the review follows, and I will review probably one of my favorite episodes in the season. The first arc involves Salver Hardin with the boarding party on the Invictus. The atmosphere in the ghost ship gives me the Event Horizon vibe. Somewhat creepy, what happened to the crews? Did they go insane because of the random hyperspatial jumps? Very intriguing indeed. I enjoy the mystery of the bloody letter Z. XO written on the bright white globe. What does it mean? Does it stand for Exo Milky Way Galaxy? Or simply referring to an executive officer? 
It's fascinating to have the possibility of extraterrestrials in the Foundation series. As far as I know, Isaac Asimov's fictional universe is devoid of alien species. As many viewers have probably suspected, the indomitable Hugo is alive again. This time around, he faked death and brought the cavalry to the rescue. Hence, this episode now confirms Hugo's status as the new Kenny of Foundation. <laughs> During Lewis and Salver's discussions about hyperspatial navigation, there is a strange proposition of spacers to be a relatively new concept to the Galactic Empire. Many viewers would probably assume that spacers are pretty ancient relative to hyperspace travel. Their original hunch is indeed correct in the original Asimov's universe. Spacers were in fact so ancient, they predated the Galactic Empire, went back even further than the emergence of Galaxia, tens of thousands years before the Foundation Era. Personally, I don't understand why the showrunner and show writers would make such a dramatic change from Asimov's robot, Empire, Foundation Universe. Spacers were the technologically advanced pioneers of humanity's hyperspatial travel in establishing exosolar colonies. In fact, they were the ones who created android robots like Ido Demerzel, who was the original prototype. Of course, the TV series has already made so many changes from the original source materials. The show is aiming for an entertaining remix rather than a dull adaptation. I do appreciate why they need to make most of those changes in order to make an engaging TV show, but I'm still puzzled about the newer age of spacers. I'm sure David S. Goyer has his reasons for changing the relative age of spacers. I realize he likes to mix up timelines, size scales, and stuff. He already shrinks the population size of the Galactic Empire to a few trillions from 500 quadrillions in the original book. Hopefully we will learn his reasons for changing the relative age of spacers in future episodes. The second arc involves Gal Dornick on board the Raven. This storyline is probably the weakest in this episode. Her sudden emotional outbursts with Hologram Hari are inconsistent with her usual mathematical mindsets. I would appreciate it if writers have offered a reasonable hypothesis such as Gaul suffering from the bipolar manic depressive personality trait. That surely would make more sense. By leaving the Raven and heading home to Synax, Gaul is off the major actions and fulfilling her destiny as the narrator of the Foundation TV series. It's hilarious she is yet again, this time volunteering, to go into stasis for another 138 years. Maybe Gaul is in fact the sleeper. <laughs> the third and final story arc involves Brother Day, Cleon 13, with many religious and political intrigues. This is my favorite part of this episode. The viewers are graced with actor Lee Pace's magnificent portrayal of Brother Day's transformative experience through physical hardships, such as hunger, thirst, and pain. Stripped of his protective shield bracelet and bloodstream nanobots, Cleon 13, probably for the first time in life, lets his guard down and feels authentic fellowship with an elderly pilgrim. With just two of them facing life or death challenges on their spiral trek together, Brother Day shows his true nature without any pretense for public consumption. There is no need to perform as the Empire, his role for life, to no audience. Brother Day shows his human nature, no longer being judged as a godlike Empire. He shows his vulnerability and compassion without witness. When the old man was exhausted and succumbed to his knees, at peace with his own fate, Brother Day tried to give him a helping hand and encouraged the devoted luminist with his unvarnished doubt. What if there is no afterlife and this is it? This was the most authentic empathy Brother Day could muster. That is the best he can do, offering an honest rhetorical question, trying to encourage a dying old man with the reason to live. The elderly pilgrim's calmly acceptance for death clearly touched Brother Day. One reveals his true character when no one else is watching. Brother Day gently pulls his old companion off the spiral path and rests him on the side, indicating a please help me sign for potential rescuers. Obviously, it is against the devoted luminist's wish. Ultimately, Brother Day is the emperor of the galaxy. He does what he thinks is best for the old man, 
without care for reverent sentiments of an elderly pilgrim's religious dying wish. Indeed, he is arrogant to a fault, but with a misconstrued good intention, he has shown us humanity. Once Brother Day has accomplished the mission of completing the spiral and convincing luminists he has a soul, now he resumes to his primary role, the Emperor. He must hide his vulnerability and compassion from others. No more humanity, but only a political machine. He obeys the axioms of powerful rulers through millennia, as inscribed in political scriptures, such as Niccolò Machiavelli's Prince and Sunsi's Art of War. A ruler must show no unnecessary mercy to deadly foes. To be feared is more important than to be loved. Cleon 13 orders Demerzel to assassinate Halima. It is a terrible way to carry out a necessary strategy. He is hurt by Demerzel's perceived disloyalty because she bowed down during Halima's eulogy, so he forces her to agonize over her loyalties to the Empire and her religion. It is a ruthless calculation, but also needlessly cruel. Demerzel is the robot with a soul. She is like a mother figure to generations of Cleon clones. She is their major domo, mentor, and confidant. She is basically with Cleons through every moment of their life from beginning to end. The chamber scene between Demerzel and Hamilla is one of the most emotional and tear-jerking moments in the Foundation series. I am deeply moved by actress Laura Brim's soulful interpretation of a distressful robot and actress Tinia Miller's dignified and loving performance of a righteous martyr. They were beautiful together. At the end of episode, Demerzel reports back to Cleon 13 and passive-aggressively challenges him about the validity of his vision. It's chilling and effective. Brother Day's flashback to the cave is haunting. He was alone in the holy cave by himself, in the pool of pristine water. Normally rational people would not dare to drink from a hygiene-challenged, still pool of salt water inside a skeleton's infested cave. Who knows besides dirt, sweat, and blood what else is in the salt water? Yes, logically speaking that you don't want to drink the potentially lethal water, but by the time anyone reached that cave, after days of hunger and thirst, one would drink anything. Remember earlier Brother Day was even afraid of drinking from a cup of water offered by Halima. Now he drinks from a still water pool in a cave. That's how typical indoctrination works in organized religions and military boot camps. They first break you down physically and psychologically. Then they supposedly build you up. So when you are in the most vulnerable, dire state of mind, you would drink anything they've given you, even potentially harmful substances or maybe an elixir. It takes a true unbeliever to not hallucinate, or should we say, having visions after drinking psychedelic water, probably laced with substances analogous to LSD. <laughs> Brother Day is certainly not a believer but an agnostic at best. He is now doubtful if he ever has a soul, a profound transformation. I'm thoroughly impressed with Lee Pace's measured performance as a fearful emperor trying to pretend confidence to the galaxy. That concludes Episode 8. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this review. I'm eagerly awaiting for the next episode. Till next time, goodbye.